Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to cover with you this morning, as Mark mentioned, risk management to risk resilience. Uh, obviously, a very appropriate topic in uh, current situation and current times. So my um, colleague, um, Elaine, will help me to operate the slide. So maybe we'll just get started. So Elaine, if you could go to the first slide. And while Elaine is doing that, um, what I will cover this morning um, is to cover some aspects of risk management, uh, the current ERM state in the charity sector, as well as to help everyone understand uh, what are some of the fundamentals in risk management to get us to a state of risk resilience. So let's move on to the first slide, which is slide five. Um, Elaine, yeah. So it looks like we're having a bit of a technical glitch here. Thank you. All right, so if we go to slide five. So I wanted to share with <clears throat> all of you um, the current state of risk. So as you all know, in the current situation, and this is really just an a, a illustration of how dynamic risk is. This is a, a survey that KPMG does on an annual basis, where we poll, as you can see at the bottom of the footnote there, uh, more than a thousand CEOs. Um, across many different sectors. So we started in pre-COVID 2020, we asked the CEOs around the, around the globe what they thought were their key risks. So as you can see where the arrows have pointed to you uh, from January 2020 to August 2020, March 2021, and now August 2021, how I suppose the point that I wanted to make was cybersecurity have started in the middle and gone all the way right to the top. What you may see that's also emerging, it's also environmental climate change risk in ESG, uh, most definitely the hot topic of today, uh, but definitely one that I think will continue to stay. What might be surprising for some of you is talent risk. August 2020, when COVID first hit, we asked the question, how do we continue with our business operations, right? Um, I'm not surprised when we wait for the Singapore results as part of this global survey, which should be launched shortly uh, next week or the week after. I'm not surprised to see that Singapore CEOs will say that talent risk as well as cyber will continue to be some of their top risks. No doubt in the charity sector as well, I'm sure all of you uh, will resonate with the fact that talent risk may be right at the top of your agenda. So in the next slide, more specifically, if I could help cover um, you know, within our own portfolio of work and the clients whom we've been working with in the charity sector, where we're starting to see, as you can see in the trend, either moving up with one arrow or two arrows, where it's a heightened, I suppose, concern in some of these areas. So not surprisingly, talent and attraction, as I mentioned earlier, uh, PDPA that we can talk about a bit later on, funding risks in times where you know, it's hard and it's tight on the purse strings of most of us in this current situation, uh, the, the new risk that we see right at the bottom here really centers around cybersecurity, IT risk. And of course, again, when it's hard, we ask ourselves our relevance in society and whether as a charity or otherwise, how do we continue to serve the community as well? And not surprisingly, attached to that is the funding risk. If you go to the next slide, and I, I wanted to, to cover again with this particular segment, as well as our panel members whom you'll hear, with, uh, hear from shortly, the technology risk. And earlier this morning's segment is how do you turn risk into opportunities? So I have a saying, um, you know, and I, I tell this to my clients, is to never waste a crisis or never waste a good crisis. So if you look at where we are today, there are organizations which have done a lot better. But to be fair, there are also organizations in various sectors, as we're well aware, that will probably do a lot worse than others. But I suppose uh, with uh, both, you know, looking at both sides of the coin, how do we change and manage risk, making them into opportunities? So one thing that we're quite uh, grateful and blessed for in, in Singapore is the fact that I, I suppose the stakeholder group, as well as the government is really helping us to push, right? For us to digitalize a lot more. And I think for those companies that you see are doing better today effectively, are those are the ones who have started their journey a lot earlier prior to COVID hitting us. And those companies which had not, 
uh, it's quite evident that in the period of going through digitalization and automation, and they are behind their competitors in this particular respect. And what you can see with digitalization as well, it brings risk in the next slide, uh, not having to belabor the point too much. These are cases that all of you have read in the news in the last 18 to 24 months. Um, so with every introduction or with every, um, I suppose, a new initiative that one may embark in your organization, correspondingly, we need to look at the other side of the coin, as I mentioned, which is what are the risks in which we will be presented with. And how do we actually manage this risk to make sure that we're both looking at the front end as well as the back end as well? I wanted to just maybe shift to the global stage and just to stay on the cyber uh, bandwagon. And this is a research that was done in UK as well as Forrester uh, earlier this year. So you can see for nonprofit and cybersecurity that 80, you know, in, in, from the reading from left to right, 58% of the charities commission of the UK thinks that cyber risk is a major risk. Cyber breaches, 83%. And in Forrester itself, there's a 600% 6, increase in COVID-19 phishing attacks in the first quarter of 20. So mind you, this is only the first quarter. So I'm sure if we were to ask the numbers that is for the whole calendar year, this amount is going to be a lot more. So other than phishing attacks, which is quite common, and if you think about the desperation of some of the charities where they lack the funds, you will find that you will get a lot more calls and emails, but not all of them are obviously going to be genuine. Right? And what this means for organization as well is that if there is the name that is being used to defraud uh, your donors out there, the reputation risk is something that we need to think about. So on that light, let me shift gears to risk management. And perhaps the first um, point that I would cover is the Code of Governance for Charities. So this code was in 2017 when it was issued and I remember working with the council uh, in trying to form you know, the basis of what good practices are. So because it is a code of governance, it is not mandatory per se, it is more comply and explain. And in this particular, I, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, principle or policy itself in 614, it says that the board should ensure that there is a process. So notice here we highlighted the word process to identify, regularly monitor, as well as review, the charity's key rates. Now, what it really means for the organization itself is the ability, as you can see in the right-hand side, is to be able to forecast and evaluate uh, in these key categories of financial compliance and operational risk, what is the likelihood as well as impact of risk to your organization, right? So it is a bit of a requirement of the board, not just the management to understand, because ultimately it goes right to the board of the organization itself. So let me share with you our observations in the last five years since the introduction of this code for the charities and IPC sector. What you will see in the next slide is that there is an increased adoption most definitely amongst the charities with respect to this ERM requirement and framework. Uh, we find that most organizations has at least documented their framework and policy. Uh, there's definitely an increased maturity vis-a-vis -vis the understanding of just the board as well as, um, uh, what do you call it, the stakeholders in terms of how risk should be managed within the organization. I think more importantly, I'm just going to move to the bottom in people and culture. Risk awareness have increased. Um, board oversight definitely becomes a permanent agenda at board meetings where risk factors, risk identification, as well as risk monitoring is discussed in most boards, or at least for the ones that we've been involved in anyway. And if you look into the operation sites, the linking of strategies and risks, as well as the relevance of what they do, is also being linked quite appropriately. Having said that, there is an improvement, but we also noted some gaps in the process. And the reality is that there will always be gaps due to the different sizes, complexity, as well as availability of resources in managing risk, and where we have perhaps just um, highlight some of the gaps in respect 
uh, relating to the PDPA framework. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, and something that I want to focus on with the panel a bit later on, is the tech and cyber security areas. And last but not least, if you think about where we are today, a lot of boards as well as management are asking, were asking, we had a risk management framework, COVID came, COVID stayed, how did our risk management framework cater for COVID-19 and other instances or events that we had identified out from? So this is about really looking at back testing what you had put in place, right? And what I will cover shortly is also what we call BCM, the Business Continuity Management Framework, right? As well as how we deal with crisis. If you go to the next slide, this is a very simple diagram of what risk governance is. Um, you know, it's a diagram that I use quite often just to explain uh, uh, the governance framework. What you will see here, the board is ultimately, in most organizations, uh, will be ultimately the responsible party. And that's what we call this a four lines of defense. There is the first, the two, and the third. So to give you an example, if you look at the procurement function where you have the maker, the person who requests to procure a particular item, you have the supervisor who approve, that would be your second line of defense. So this is what you call first and second line as a simple example, where you put a process and a policy or control in place or maker or checker. Obviously what you do want to make sure is that the maker and checker works, which is why you would normally have what we call a third line of defense, which is typically your internal audit function, right? Outside that circle, which is external that most of you would be aware of, are your external auditors as well as the regulators. What I think is important in this whole diagram in governance is really the conduct and the culture. And this is where I think the board, as I you know, caught the tail end of what Gerard said, I think what's important is the board oversight with respect to the tone from the top and the culture that the board sets at the very top that permeates to the entire organization. And this is where if I could leave the one thing for you here, this uh, session is really the fact that in all organizations, any organizations, whether it be profit or non-profit, non you always have to deal with what we call people, process and systems. So if you think about process and systems, these are what I call hard controls. The people are what I call the soft controls. So if you consider people and process uh, and systems, as being the three key elements that binds an entire organization today, ask yourself, which is the hardest to control? Not surprisingly, it will be the people aspect that is the hardest to control. And I know for a fact that in the charity sector, talent risk probably would be your biggest risk. And that's something that we can explore with a panel a bit later on. Vis-a-vis -vis how then if talent and people is a challenge, how then can technology help you in your operations as well as your, I suppose, ambition and vision to help you to mitigate, to be more resilient and to be more forthright in trying to achieve what you set out to do. So let me move on to the basic crux of ERM. And this is really a simple, I would suppose, I call it a, a process. And ERM or risk management effectively, to me, is not rocket science because all of you, whether you're aware or not so, you do practice risk management every single day, be it your financial, uh, financial discipline at home or even crossing the road. If you think about that, you're really managing your own risk per se. Of, of course, for you to manage the risk, you firstly need to identify what that risk is. Once you've identified that risk, you ask yourself, is that high risk to me, medium risk? This is an interesting point that I'll bring to you a bit later on, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, that because people are your biggest risk, people are also subjective when it comes to risk assessment itself. This is why we need to get the whole entire organization in and at the same page, right? I talked a lot earlier about the tone from the top and culture, right? If you think about two distinct organizations, one, which is very aggressive in the initial years of growing and one which is stable and need not take unnecessary risks. That would be what I call setting the tone and the risk appetite at the top. Once we're able to assess the risk, we obviously try to manage it and going forward, we will monitor and report if the risk stays the same. 
Okay, so this is an, um, a, a profile of I call a, a typical charity. So if you look on your left, it's what I call the risk universe. And I think what's important at the board level when I showed you the corporate governance framework is to really think about your risk in these buckets, in a strategic bucket, the financial bucket, compliance bucket. Not surprisingly, operational, you find that that's where you have the most risk for any organization. And last but not least, the technology bucket. And why it's important to have it in such a simple, I call it diagram like this, where I call it a five by five matrix. We talk about uh, likelihood, we talk about impact. It's about give it, getting everyone to be on the same page, right? It's about getting everyone to understand that if you had eight risks or 10 risks out there, you may be wondering which is your top risk. So this is what I call the meeting of minds where you get the board, you get the management, you really just list down, and this will not be a, a real science on art. It's probably, I would say, a combination of both, but at least it's a first step with respect to recognizing what you think the key risks are in your organization. So I'll move to the next slide and probably cover a bit more uh, technical aspects of risks as well as controls. So the main key thing here is to recognize that with every risk factor, you think about the controls as well. So risk management always deals with internal controls. And this is where I perhaps leave you with two concepts or rather this particular concept of adequacy and effectiveness. In the same measure that I gave the example of the procurement where there is a maker, number one, and there's a checker, number two, that relates to what I call the design of the actual process itself. So one would say that, well, you know, the risk of procurement is obviously unauthorized purchases. And we've designed the process where we have a maker and checker. So we said, yeah, that, that process is adequately designed. The next question one would ask, it doesn't mean that because it's there, the question one would ask, is it working or not? And that's where the third line of defense comes in. So this is how the first, second, and third line of defense operates in sync to really help either the key management or the board to determine, number one, is it adequate? If it's adequate by design, number two, is it actually working or not, right? So most of the fraud cases or most of the lapses that you see, it's not because they did not have a good design of internal control process. They did. But what was not working is actually the operating effectiveness. And one would ask question as to why was it not uh, followed? And again, it's not because you didn't have a process or a system, but because it's the people. So unfortunately, I think people are the weakest link in any organization, including mine. Um, because we are not consistent every day, every minute, unlike if we automate a particular process. So in the same example, if we automated the manual process of procurement to ensure there's a maker and a checker, meaning to say that that procurement request will not go through without a check, right? If it's automated, more likely than not that you would get a better control effectiveness compared to if that particular process was done manually. So that's how it works in terms of trying to understand, number one, what your risks are, and number two, with the risks, do you have the right controls in place? Are they adequate and are they working? So I'll move on to the next slide. And this is a simple risk register which I'll not go through because with each of the risks that I showed in the earlier slide, what one would do is to go through to identify in detail what are your risks and what are your controls. So in the interest of time, let me move on. Okay, I wanted to also cover two key concepts here. One is what I call dynamic risk. And this is important because I think in the traditional sense where we sort of undertake risk management, we tend to look at risk on a very static manner, which means to say, if you look on your left, right, you plot all your risk on this diagram, you look at each risk on its bubble on its own. But in reality is that all the risks are actually connected. So in the COVID situation, what we did find was that <clears throat> organizations which fared better were the organizations that were more able to connect the dots or connect the risks. So in this particular example, if you look at the orange bubble, which is the start of COVID, we would say that we have an adverse event in COVID-19. And the main thing that one would basically ask, as we all did, are our employees safe? And that goes up to the top there, right? But if you look at how this connects to the entire organization, what you will then realize is that, hang on, COVID actually not only had a 
an impact on our people's well-being, but in fact, it had an impact across the entire organization in almost everything we do, including donation, and in some instances, as well as going concern. We did find that some charities could no longer operate because they didn't have any donors left at the end of the day. They were left exposed to the fact that their only channel of fundraising dried up. Uh, it got limited by the fact that you can't meet people. And if you look at this whole diagram, my point that I wanted to make that risk is not only static, it is connected and it is dynamic. My next point, once you've understood this, and I look at the BCN piece, which I covered a bit earlier before our own disruption, is that, you know, is this particular risk that you look at COVID-19, is it a threat to the organization? How do we manage it? If we can't, the question is that, do we have a BCP plan? So this is a real wake up call. I think not just for charities, but for most corporates whom we have been working for. They had great plans on the table that they looked at every quarter. But when the rubber hits the road, the question is that how did this plan manifested in unfolding our resiliency at the end of the day? And then you go to the next slide. And again, one would ask what is operational resiliency? If I skip this slide, perhaps go to the next slide. Operational resiliency is about the, uh, the ability to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances or environment. And this includes both your processes and systems. And this is where that, you know, with a geopolitical situation happening up north with the Swiss Canal, supply chain obviously created a lot of havoc across goods, services, and products. And this is about whether there are alternate routes one would take that allowed us to continue to operate as BAU. And this is what really, if I could put it in a nutshell, what operational resiliency is all about. A couple more slides to go before we get to the panel. And I'm rushing slightly because of the time that we lost. And this is about looking at recovery as well as the new reality. So in this slide, what you can see is really the understanding of our response. How are we able to optimize and how are we able to move from the recovery to what I call the BAU? And this particular example here, it's really on <clears throat> looking at how we optimize what I call risk management itself. The next slide. And as we <clears throat> look at most organizations, they're starting to go back to the drawing board, right? And on the left, may be quite familiar with some of us here. How do we continue? in the midst of COVID-19 to drive up our donations or revenue. That may also involve improving customer experience. And by wanting to do that, we may have to look at a different channel, which is effectively almost to create a digital business model itself. And that adds on to what I call new risk, as I mentioned earlier. And you saw in the previous slide, as we move towards digitalization, unfortunately, we whilst we create new opportunities, but we're also creating new risks in the whole environment itself. So before I get to the panel, I just want everyone to think about this last slide, which is the next one. And these are just considerations for organizations to ask ourselves as we look from the board management to line one, line two, invention line three, how are we able to number one, identify the risks Number two, optimize the risk or, as I mentioned, take advantage of the crisis and move to the next stage to be more resilient. So with that, I would pause.